Hey there, Cindy Dole, and this is a special behind-the-scenes look into the making of the Rose Parade floats. And we've been hearing what can and can't go onto a float. And by the way, the answer to where all that white stuff on the floats like ocean waves comes from, it's coconut. Well, you're going to learn more about these things in the coming moments as we see how, really, when you go to take a look at the floats up close, where they decorate those final days before the parade, and even after post-parade, that's where you really appreciate all the detail and all the work that goes into these incredible incredibly stunning works of art that make their way down Colorado Boulevard on New Year's Day. So I thought I'd take you with me to see firsthand all the planning, the creative thinking, and the passion that goes into each and every float. In Sierra Madre and the foothills above Arcadia in the San Gabriel Valley, it's really quite the grassroots effort that not only builds floats, but builds friendships and bonds that last a lifetime. Don Mills is a longtime volunteer with the city, and he walked me through their barn where they make their float each year off Sierra Madre Boulevard. Our funding is all raised by flipping hamburgers and running bingo contests and sending out appeal letters and donations of the general public that comes in. They raise all the money. The city of Sierra Madre, being relatively small, doesn't provide necessarily any funds. They help us with the police department and the fire department getting to and from the parade, as well as some of the insurance and this building mm -hmm. as well. So. Which That's is worth thing. a lot, right? It's yeah. worth a lot to us. So, so I mean, but our, how? Uh, before we get to your design, I mean, mm -hmm. the whole idea of not having the funding—that's huge because you guys have won awards and look just as professional and spectacular as those companies right. that get paid boku bucks, That's right? That's correct. That's correct. The, our budget is relatively small for floats. We're probably the smallest in the parade, and the difference is. Uh, the volunteer, the labor, that's a huge cost. Okay, and if we can minimize the amount of labor in terms of cost, which we don't pay anybody uh, for their time and effort, uh, it reduces the cost a lot. And if we're prudent in the way that we buy our steel that goes in the construction and the wood, if we get it materials donated and do a good job in buying flowers and dry material, we can hold the cost down and still do an excellent float. So you have to be very creative. You have to be creative in the uses. And, yeah. You have to be creative with the financing, um, and you have to control it. You have to watch what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so we, like any other organization, we run a budget. We run it fairly tightly. And uh, though it's not, uh, we don't nail everything right down to the letter, um, we watch it very closely because the money is there. We have to have the money. I think it's interesting. We have to have the money even for the next year's float, even before this one runs on the street. Okay, because we have startup costs that are entry fees and insurance and all the rest. Sure, the started. float insurance, no one you know, really sure. thinks about that, but I mean, so, how much is float insurance? It, it can be thousands upon thousands of dollars uh, for float insurance, so uh, it's a major expense. And for the reason us. you have that is if, if something well, goes we wrong, if something goes wrong, you would hope not, but uh, it can happen. It's happened before, and uh, you certainly don't want it to happen, but we have float insurance just for that eventuality. But it's about 15 families that do it all, from the administration to the finance, to the buying, to the fundraising, to the deco, uh, as well as all of the construction. And this becomes so, a family, doesn't it? It is a family. Uh, we really are. We know each other very well. We all come from different backgrounds. That's the fun thing. And uh, we have a whole group of volunteers that come in from all over the United States uh, in the next week. We'll all be sleeping here in the park. Uh, I'll have two or three sleeping on my living room floor coming in from Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, they come in every year. Uh, let's see. Furthest away has been Tasmania. I mean, wow. I got a, a lady up here who just flew in from England. I mean, people see it on TV and they go, how can I be a part of it, right? Right, right. And anybody can, as far as this particular float is concerned. Uh, we don't have many restrictions. We're... We're always seeking volunteers because most people don't know where Sierra Madre is. You know, it's important for a lot of people to, to have the experience. It's kind of like on their bucket list. I want to work on a float, okay? And I occasionally get people come in and say, can I just put a flower on them? We don't do it that way. So if we can get them to come in and spend a little time, about four hours, they'll get their experience and they can say they've done it. So how did you decide that this is the, the theme you wanted to have? I mean, you try to be different from the previous year. You have to oh, follow yes. certain rules from the tournament. Right. So it isn't like it's a non-compete, right? You have to be unique to, among float builders. We try to be. They, they, there's a theme. There's a theme. We have to follow the president's theme. We also have to, as all float builders do, present at what's called theme draft, which is the first week of February this year, to the president and the float committee. And they then 
take a look at all the float designs and make sure that there's no duplication of the theme and or the types of items that are on the float. Mm -hmm. You know, too many elephants or too many rock bands or too many whatever. You know, you're on to your next drawing if that occurs. Mm -hmm. So this that guarantees the uniqueness of the uh, parade and for us obviously it guarantees that more than likely no other float will be like this one. Right. Everyone so wins that way, everyone's right? Everyone's yeah. fine. Yeah. It's great. So once that's done then we go in with a basic sketch, and I'm looking around quickly at the floor here, but I don't see one. Yeah, up oh, there okay. at the top, there's the one from the... Oh, okay. That's the basic sketch that we uh -huh. uh, present to the tournament. And from there, uh -huh. it comes back, they give us approval, then it's blueprinted, and then we go from there. Have you ever been turned down? Is yes. That, really? Oh, yeah. What happened? Well, basically, we were on to our next design. We go in not with one design, but with a minimum of 10 different designs. Okay, they get submitted. Because the reality is if we have a low number, it's kind of like a NFL lottery, if we go in and pick a number out of a fishbowl, and if we get number one or two or three, okay, to present to the tournament, we're probably going to get our design accepted. If we get number 26, somebody may already have our idea. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go on to number two or number three or number four. And In the past, we've had to go that deep. Does it get pretty competitive? I mean, are you worried about people spying on your ideas or any of that? You know, we don't. Um, I'm sure the other commercial builders are very concerned about it uh, because it's, it's big bucks. This is a, a big business. It's a multi-million dollar business, and the exposure for their clients is, is key as far as TV coverage, radio coverage. Uh, it's not that big of a deal for us, quite frankly. <laughs> Less pressure. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, we don't necessarily put any restrictions on uh, the competitive side of things. Uh, once we're approved, that's it. Okay, and people will say, well, I'll give them a picture of it and say, well, can I show my friends? It'll be like in June or July. And I say, oh, sure, I don't, it's not a problem. Nope. <laughs> you know, it's going to be in the parade. That's what it is. There's, there's no secrets here. So, yeah, the answer is, yeah, I think it is competitive between some, but for us, it's not. Again, it's it's like a hobby. Yeah. It's a passion for sure. us. It's it's not about the competition. I mean, if you get a, a banner or a trophy or an award, that's it. That's, there's nothing monetarily involved for us. We don't get any money from it. We don't get a big plaque or a Do you break even gum. at least? I mean, do you ever get, are you ever in the red when doing your Oh, no, no. We break. Oh, yeah. No, no. I have to make money. Uh, yeah. So I got money to go into the next, next year. year. Yeah. Right. So, no, no. Uh, the whole plan in terms of the budget um, says I'm mm -hmm. going to come out ahead on this and so I'm in a position. We are a charity, we are a nonprofit, um, and as such money that's left over gets rolled into the other float or we give away scholarships. We should point out that another unique thing about Sierra Madre's float is anyone anywhere in the U.S. can submit their design idea and get it turned into a float, if they're lucky. In fact, they've had kids win in the past. Charles Meyer is the float designer for the 2011 float, and he also won for their Bollywood India theme, you might remember from a few years back. This time, it's based on the mission in Carmel, Sueños de California, early California. You designed this baby. I did, indeed, yes. Started sketching out the idea actually um, August of 2009. So it's been in the works for a little while now. So you, you came up with this even before the past Rose Parade. I did, that's true. So no one can say that you copied it from the past parade. This was already on paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's true, that's true. Of course, we take inspiration from all the floats over the years. But um, So how do you get inspired? I mean, what is a good idea for a float? Well, first of all, you want an idea that fits the theme, something that's going to make sense with the parade. And this year's theme is building dreams, friendships, and memories. And the California Mission seemed like a wonderful way to honor that theme and represent it. Um, our association has different needs from year to year. One of the things we needed this year was a float that would make a big statement but uh, not be too demanding on our construction crew. One of the most demanding types of floats to build is uh, a type of design that's going to require a lot of sculptural welding. So anything with, for example, giant animals, all of those animals have to be bent out of steel into three dimensions, and that's very time-consuming and difficult. One of the advantages of this float is that because it's so architectural, we could use a lot of plywood, and it went together faster in that way. Um, but 
it also allows us an opportunity to do some really beautiful flowering. So the bougainvillea growing over the mission is all going to be made up of about 15,000 orchids, mm. for example. The deck of the float's going to be carpeted in roses, and then we'll have citrus trees and uh, bird of paradise. But 15,000 orchids yes. for a nonprofit little old Sierra Madre, that sounds expensive. I mean, orchids aren't cheap. Well, we, we budget out very carefully, and about half of the floral budget is going to those orchids. So um, we've decided that we try to sort of alternate between having a large float and a smaller float the following year. So this would, will be our big float year, and it'll have a bigger budget. And then next year, we'll probably scale back to give ourselves a break and to help with our budget situation as well. Mm -hmm. And how did you get inspired by the Carmel mission? I mean, have you been there before? Or, well, I mean, you know, everybody why does this mission? mission reports uh, when they're in fourth grade. Right. And um, <laughs> mine actually wasn't the Carmel mission. I think I did Mission Santa Barbara, if memory serves. But doing research, I, I liked the idea of doing a mission, but I wanted something that was different. And the Carmel mission has a very distinctive facade with its two... Um, mismatched bell towers one of them has a moorish dome on it just had a really different kind of look and uh, i thought that that would be something that would add some flavor to the parade and so what is your day job <laughs> right now i've got a part-time job caring for an elderly woman um with dementia oh. and that's what i'm doing for the time being i've done a variety of things over the years from designing theater sets to actually working for some of the professional float builders, working for some design companies. And when it's all done, then you just kind of go through this depression, <laughs> right? It's over. It was like the show is over, or then you just kind of get into the next one. Yeah, I don't know that it is depression. One of the things I actually like about Rose Parade Floats is it's a very temporal sort of art form. Um, it keeps you humble in a way. It's not going to be around for generations to admire. It's really only finished for one day, and then it, you're tearing it apart just a few weeks later to start on the next one. Um, in terms of the after effects, I will say that in past years, I've had nightmares for up to a month after the parade, <laughs> thinking that... The Rose Parade float is parked outside, and I have to run out and finish it. <laughs> and I will be awake, and it'll take me a good five or ten minutes to remind myself, no, the parade is over. It's done. So when the parade is over, the Sierra Madre float goes on display in the heart of town. It's used as a fundraiser. They sell the flowers. They sell the art, like the butterflies on the float, as topiaries, all to raise money for next time. And Jean Stevenson has been working on those butterflies. She came in from Sheffield, England, because for her, this is therapy. And I was over here last winter recovering from a bereavement and looking for something to occupy myself and came up here and loved it so much I'm back again. I really enjoyed it and the people here made me so welcome and made me forget my problems and just get engrossed in doing something finicky like sticking lentils with glue. You can just forget your problems and get on with life yeah and we're still at the stage where the flowers obviously aren't here yet so you're working on lentils you say lentils. seeds you're making a monarch butterfly so tell me what your assignment is here I'm just um, the, the shapes being cut and then the pattern has been painted and then we're gluing and putting the color on the background so there will be yellow flowers petals on here lentils on this bit and, and what's I the peach color it's uh, ground-up lentils, believe it or oh, not. Isn't this it because you have orange and peach? Yeah, it's, gr this, it's, it's this ground up. Wow. Okay. And then I think it's going to be ground rice on the outside. So what is the black? Seeds, again. I don't know what seeds, but some right. seeds from some black plant. Bl black well, onion seed. Black onion seed is, is the, the, the striking um, outline for the monarch. It's amazing, the colors that are in nature, isn't it? And really, you, you are kind of painting by numbers, right? Yeah. They have given you kind of an outline and an outline your sticking, orders, and yeah, away you go. Painting, painting by numbers and getting yourself very sticky, but yes, yeah, very good. Good fun, if we can get the world. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's fantastic.
and fun it is. By the way, if you're thinking of volunteering to decorate a float next time, it's a good idea to check the website for the Tournament of Roses, tournamentofroses.com, and touch base with the list of the float design companies or communities to get on their volunteer list so that you can make it part of your bucket list experience. All right. So coming up, we're going to visit with some of the big professional float design companies who answer to big corporations with big budgets, hoping to get their message to millions around the world. I'm Cindy Dole. Back after this.